Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to go on an adventure to a nearby galaxy known as Large Magellanic Cloud, where we actually have been before in one of the previous videos, but today we're going to be talking about some, some of the more interesting things about it, and we're going to visit some of the more interesting objects in this really awesome galaxy that you see in the back right there. Anyway, let's go and explore it and welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So you may have watched some of the previous videos where I actually talked about specific objects from the Large Magellanic Cloud, but today we're going to talk specifically about this galaxy and we're going to talk about some of the cool things in it and some of the more well-known representatives of um, this galaxy as well. First of all, let's actually go there. It's going to take us a while to get there if we go there at the speed of light. As a matter of fact, it's only... Oh, not only, but it's at least 140 to possibly 180,000 light years away from us. Meaning that the light that we see from it is like, at an average, at least 150,000 years old. So first and foremost, where is this galaxy located in, in relation to our own Milky Way? Let's escape the Milky Way, turn around and take a look at it, because that way you'll be able to visualize it a little bit better. So we're going to go a little bit closer to it. Stop right here, and now move away, increase the brightness just a little bit, and take a look at this right here. So this is us, this is the Milky Way, we're somewhere right here, and this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. As you can see, it's a lot smaller than the Milky Way, it's about one-tenth in terms of mass, and in terms of number of stars, and right next to it is, it's sort of an official sibling known as Small Magellanic Cloud. And there's actually a very unusual bridge connecting these two, containing a lot of various gases. And, well, mostly actually just hydrogen gas. And this bridge suggests that these galaxies were somehow connected before, and it's very likely that the Milky Way actually disturbed them. And we actually think that this galaxy was a spiral galaxy before, and once again, the Milky Way made it look like it does today, made it look like an irregular galaxy. And we used to think that this, is, was, this was just an irregular galaxy that has no specific shape, but then we realized that it's actually a specific type of irregular galaxy known as a barred irregular galaxy, which suggests that it was a spiral galaxy or something with a bar before and was disturbed by gravitational interaction with the Milky Way and possibly small Magellanic Cloud. Now, why Magellanic? Well, if you know anything about history and exploration, there was a person by the name of Fernando Magellan. He was a Portuguese explorer a long time ago who basically was famous for exploring the world. And uh, he used these in his uh, navigation. And many other cultures used Magellanic clouds in their navigation as well. If you've watched the Disney's Moana, they actually briefly mention uh, these, these uh, two galaxies. And um, the Polynesian culture specifically used them quite a lot because they were so clear to see and they were always in the same region of space. But the Large Magellanic Cloud is um, a little bit different from Small Magellanic Cloud in one major, uh, or for one major reason. This galaxy right here has a lot of really, really young, really new stars, and it's actually uh, a region of space that's kind of known for being the most active um, starburst region. Basically, a lot of new stars are created here at all times. A lot of new stars are made every single, practically every single day, actually. And the most famous region in this galaxy that, that has uh, these new stars being created is right here. And I've talked about this region before. We're going to zoom into it. We're going to go and explore it in a little bit more detail by uh, switching to manual navigation. And this region is known as the Tarantula Nebula. Now, Tarantula Nebula is actually the brightest and the most massive nebula we know, and it's also the most active um, star generation, or I guess you can call it star creation region of space, at least in the nearby regions, in, in the nearby uh, part of the universe. Now, this particular region is known for a very bright supernova that happened here in, in 1987, or I guess the light from it reached us in 1987, and it was known as 1987A supernova. And it was really, really bright. It's the brightest one we've ever seen, which means that it was a very massive star that exploded, and it allowed us to study supernova in more detail. 
And many of these stars are actually very young, very massive, and will explode, creating tremendous supernova. Now, the most famous region in this torrential nebula is known as R136, and I made a video about it previously, you can check it out on the channel. And it's actually, we're headed toward it, it's right here, it's this blue part. Uh, well, here it's only showing you R136, a1, which is a binary system of two wolf rayet stars, and this is just some of these stars. There's like something like 70 stars in this region, and they're all very, very bright, very massive. And R136A1 is the most massive star we've discovered to date. It's about 315 masses of our own sun. And you're about to see what it looks like. We're going to make them orbit around one another. There they are. These two beautiful wolf rayet stars that are going to, in the next million years or so, explode and create a tremendously large supernova, followed by a relatively large black hole, or possibly two black holes. And this region, R136, is also going to be um, responsible for creating a very large uh, globular cluster in the future. And this global cluster will then result in the creation of many, many different uh, sun-like stars or possibly even red dwarfs that will stay in there for billions of years. So all of this will be happening right here in the Tarantula Nebula. And this is something that many scientists are looking forward to. Hopefully we'll still be around to see at least one more supernova coming from this region. Now, anyway, so let's move on. Um, two other important parts of the Large Magellanic Cloud. And actually, before I even talk about them, uh, I just wanted to mention that most of this galaxy is essentially just hydrogen. It's very rich in metals, and when we, when we say metals in astronomy, we mean non-hydrogen stuff. So most of the stuff here is practically just hydrogen. And because of this, there's a lot of many massive stars that may not really have any planets around them. They will just uh, be made up of hydrogen, possibly like gas giant stuff. So well, I guess in the sense that this would be a planet, but there would not be a lot of terrestrial planets, which also suggests that chance for life in this galaxy is pretty slim, especially with all the supernova happening that would most likely destroy any possibility of life. Now, what is this? Let's take a look at this. If you uh, may have not heard of the star before, but this star is actually pretty well known because it is one of the most luminous and also one of the largest stars we've discovered, known as WOHG64. I'm going to zoom into it and take a look at it just so you can see what it looks like. And uh, WOHG64 is just a little bit smaller than the largest star we've discovered, known as UYSQTI. This one is pretty big as well, though. It's about as you'll see in a second, it's about eight astronomical units in radius, meaning that if we were to place this in the middle of our uh, solar system, it would very likely cover uh, Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury, and possibly even Jupiter. So it's pretty big. It's a pretty big red supergiant. And uh, it's in top 10 largest stars we've discovered to date. And all of this is also in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't have any planets around it, so we're going to escape and take a look at another star that does have planets. So, there's actually at least one more star that I wanted to show you in this game, but it, it doesn't actually exist here yet. It's known as VFTS 682, which is also one of the most massive stars discovered, but that star is known as also one of the most brightest. It's about 3.2 million times brighter than our sun, and it's also located um, in Tarantula Nebula, but unfortunately, it's not present in Space Engine. But we do have another really interesting star known as S Doratus. If you type S Dor, uh, S D O R, you'll be able to see it right there. There, there is S Doratus, a very interesting, uh, very bright star that's known as the Luminous Blue Variable Star. As a matter of fact, it's a very unique star because it's one of the few blue stars that changes its brightness every few years. And because it's so bright, um, we actually are not entirely sure what exactly is happening here and why it's so bright. But uh, we today we think that it changes its brightness because it releases so much material that sometimes that material sort of covers the brightness of the star. 
and as it sort of cools down and um, and becomes more transparent, the brightness comes out again. So there's a lot of complex stuff going on in this particular system known as as Doradus. Uh, now you can't really see this star with your naked eye, but if you have telescopes or if you have binoculars, you'll and zoom into this area, you'll be able to see it pretty pretty well because it is ridiculously ridiculously bright, even though it's so far away from us. And let's actually maybe take a look at some of the planets that this particular system has, because unlike other stars in um, in this particular uh, galaxy, this star seems to have planets. Now, we don't know if this is true in reality, because these are procedurally generated, but th there's at least one planet that is known as um, Asdorator 7 that has a temperature of about 60 degrees Celsius. So maybe it has liquid water on the surface. So let's check it out. Let's take a look at it. And unfortunately, it doesn't. It's just an empty world with very little gravity, no atmosphere, and kind of looks like our own moon, actually. Well, that's very unfortunate. What about the next one here? Let's take a look at that one as well. This is known as Asdoratus 6. And this one, wow, this is actually very interesting. It does have water, but it's actually water in the atmosphere. And this at atmospheric water creates what seems to be a ridiculously strong greenhouse effect of about 500 degrees Celsius, meaning that there is no liquid water here either. Just very unusual, very thick atmosphere that we're going to go inside of just to see what it looks like. So this planet has a temperature of about 600 degrees Celsius, which is just a little bit too hot. And this is what the surface of this planet might look like if you were to land on it. And here we go. A world of Asdorator 6. Not particularly friendly to life, and not particularly friendly to human life either. You would definitely need to have some really strong suits and some ridiculously powerful uh, capsules to survive on the surface of this planet because it's too hot and too pressurized as well. The atmospheric pressure here is like 2000 atmospheres. Anyway, so that's just some of the planets here. I think a lot of them are basically very hot because this star is very, very powerful and very bright as well. And the closest planet known as Asdorados 1 is about 1.6 thousand degrees Celsius, has very, very thick atmosphere filled with helium and methane, and it's actually a scorched ice giant. This is what we would uh, more commonly refer to as a hot Jupiter. It's a gas giant with a lot of moons that basically is super, super, super hot, and there are the moons orbiting around it. Let's actually make this run a little bit faster, just so you can see how beautiful this, this becomes. And so this is Asdorados, not a star that is of particular interest to us, but nevertheless, it's fun to explore these in Space Engine because you never know what you're going to find. This one has quite a lot of moons, actually. And this is the essence of Large Magellanic Cloud and the most important things about it as well. One thing I didn't mention yet, and I'm going to mention as soon as I zoom out of here, is that one day a large Magellanic Cloud and small Magellanic Cloud is actually going to merge with our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and will become part of it as well. So uh, both of these galaxies are going to collide with the, the Milky Way and then the Milky Way galaxy will actually combine with Andromeda galaxy, creating one mega-sized galaxy. For now, though, that's what we have. And this is what it looks like from a distance. And, well, anyway, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. And hopefully you learned something from it. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share this video with someone who enjoys watching space videos and wants to learn through video games. And come back tomorrow to learn something else. And to possibly find out something about our universe you didn't know before. Let's escape our galaxy and go for a bit of an adventure across the universe. And thank you for watching. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.